Okay. So taking this with me again? Yeah, it's you great. So thanks a lot. You're welcome. See ya. What, what is your nickname on the UFC? I'm uh, Voucher. Just the first name. Okay. Thanks a lot. Is it possible that I can use uh, power from what, what do you want to use? Uh, power. Power? I don't know. Yeah, it's a good Okay, thanks. Let's go back. This one? No, it's on. Good? No, it's on. Blah, 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 blah. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah? Okay, good. The, 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 okay. Yeah, I don't know if the rest of Everybody, it looks like we're going to fill up again this talk, so if there are any seats in the middle, speak to me, please. Blah, 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 blah. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Blah, blah, blah. Blah, blah, blah. So especially, excuse me, back row, can you move over towards the camera, please? Okay, our next speaker, uh, always popular, Bert from Holland is going to talk about switch dev, uh, which is essentially a uh, software environment for white box switches, is that correct? No, 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 that was last year. That was last year, okay. So this is a kernel subsystem. The kernel subsystem, okay. Switch that. Bert, take it away. All right. Hey, good morning. Um, so I'm here to talk about uh, switch dev. Um, so uh, first, uh, a little bit of um, history to, um, to set it up. Um, so what's an Ethernet switch, uh, uh, basically? Um, initially, an Ethernet switch was no more than uh, oops, what was called uh, a bridge. Something to forward Ethernet frames between basically uh, two wires. You can't just uh, connect two wires together. So you had something like something called a bridge, um, which was an issue you know, useful for like a repeater and stuff like that to, to stretch the length of uh, an Ethernet run. Um, but of course, that was um, very limited. Uh, you can you know you can only connect two two uh, lines to a bridge, so therefore multiport bridges uh, started coming in. But so we're talking about like 34 years ago, by the way. Um, so a multiport bridge, um, oops, formerly known as a, a hub. You get a packet in on one port, and it just floods it out to all the other ports. So um, hubs became uh, very unpopular very fast, because obviously uh, they tended to um, just generate a lot of traffic where it didn't need to go. So in came switches. Um, what are switches formally, uh, as different as, as they are different to hubs? Um, essentially, uh, they, they have an FDB, a forwarding database. Uh, it does learning and aging of Macs. Right? Um, that means it sees a packet come in on one port, an Ethernet packet, a frame, sorry. Um, it remembers that uh, the source MAC address came in on that port, and therefore, if it ever gets a, a frame destined for that MAC address, it'll send it out to that port. Yeah? It'll do that by uh, storing that entry in the FTB. Just MAC address port, that's, that's the, the essentials of it. That's the, the least of an FTB. Um, aging is an important part of that. Um, uh, we keep a timer, and if, uh, if it hasn't seen a packet from, uh, is it five minutes or? Okay, you said like five minutes left. <laughs> Jesus, God, what have I done? Um, 
<laughs> no, so, um, you know, if, if you see um, uh, a packet come in, um, okay, you, you know that it belongs there from that, on that port, but uh, if it hasn't uh, generated any traffic, you should age it out because maybe that, um, maybe that host has moved to a different port, different segment of the network, and therefore you should, um, you know, start flooding it again out of all the ports. So, then uh, what came in, um, uh, afterwards was uh, VLANs, uh, very important. It's uh, a way to segment your switches. Uh, lots of ways to do VLANs, but uh, you can you can do uh, uh, the VLAN priority tagging uh, as uh, codified in 802.1Q, the standard, um, or you can just do a partition switch where uh, you don't have any extra tags on, on your Ethernet frames, but uh, you're, you're Basically, you can figure your switch to be like two different switches, three different switches. Um, and if you want to have forward traffic between those partitions, you actually have to connect the wire. So that's the basics of an Ethernet switch, right? Um, now, we've been able to do um, an Ethernet switch or an emulation of it, you might say, in, in the kernel for a long time. Um, but that was, uh, of course, uh, a software thing. Uh, you use um, a bunch of NICs, basically. You, you, you put a bunch of cards, you put like four or whatever cards in your, um, uh, in your server, um, and you can configure a bridge, a software bridge. And it'll, it'll, you know, it's got an FTB all, all implemented in the kernel, and uh, you can, um, uh, you know, it'll forward uh, frames between them, things like that, and, and route them out to uh, IP interfaces, things like that, as needed. But of course, there are some limitations there. Um, very good. Um, first off, everything is done by CPU. Um, so you need, uh, need the actual general purpose CPU to do uh, a bunch of uh, comparing, comparing of uh, frames, uh, frame MAC addresses, uh, looking up in, in the FTB. And it's not super efficient. Switches tend to be um, a lot more uh, specialized. They have, they have specialized uh, memory, typically, for, for implementing an FDB that just makes it faster to do lookups. Um, another thing, of course, is um, these things tend to be I.O. bound. Uh, initially, uh, in early Linux, um, getting a frame on, an, on a NIC uh, meant getting an interrupt uh, on your CPU. The interrupt would then uh, uh, cause the kernel to uh, receive the frame from the NIC, but of course, too many interrupts kind of kind of ruins your performance anyway. That was uh, solved a long time ago. Um, I forget what that's called. What was that that system called? Uh, sorry. Perfect. NEPI. That's it. Um, but basically, um, just just. Uh, handling more, more than one frame per interrupt. But, of course, uh, you, you've still got uh, the same problem. Um, as long as the kernel is, um, uh, is, is doing all this manual work on a, on a you know, general purpose CPU, it's not going to be super, um, super performant, right? So, um, then something interesting started happening. Um, Little, um, little server routers and switches started coming out, uh, starting with uh, the venerable WRT54G, and of course the Open WRT project came in. Now these, um, these are really kind of uh, very specialized. They're small CPUs, but they have a built-in switch chip. Uh, that means that they have typically something like uh, five Ethernet ports, and you can configure those, uh, the switch chips, to actually do uh, the switching between them. In other words, you program their FDB. You program the switch's FDB, so that if it gets a frame from one port, it, 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 it could actually know, oh, I'll just, I'll just switch it through. I don't need to um, send that to the CPU. Of course, much more, um, much more uh, interesting, particularly on those little uh, server routers where the CPU really isn't that strong. It really, uh, you, you can't really do CPU switching on those, right? 
So the OpenWRT project uh, needed a way to um, configure those switch chips in there. Um, the problem, of course, was that um, you can't just use the vendor uh, software, so vendor provided software or source code uh, to program those, uh, those chips because um, it's, uh, it's, it's, oh, sorry. Looks like. Okay. The problem is that um, those those vendor software uh, tended to be quite hacky. Um, a lot of it was um, was done in uh, in user space. All right. That's okay. That's one thing. Uh, but a lot of it was, it was very much a hack. Um, programming uh, a switch chip via some some random uh, SPI port or I square C port. Nothing standardized about it at all. And that was a real problem. Um, what the OpenWIT folks found themselves doing was um, uh, having to um, do do real wildly different things to get the switch chips in, in different platforms. So they came up with an abstraction, a switch configuration uh, setup called SWconfig. Um, and it's basically, it's a kernel framework um, and, and some user space tools uh, to um, abstract out the programming of switch chips. Um, and that's, uh, and it, it really got them ahead uh, because there wasn't anything like that in the kernel at the time, the mainline kernel. Um, so it was a big win for them. Um, they, uh, the features they needed to support tended to be kind of wild. Uh, I'm not sure what all was in there, but it was it was just you know random stuff that's supported by um, by uh, vendor uh, Ethernet uh, switch chips. Um, some weird features sometimes. I'm, I'm not sure if SWconfig really supports them all, but you know. The problem with that was that um, SWConfig was never upstream to the mainline kernel. Um, I'm not entirely sure if uh, the OpenWT product tried to upstream it, it was refused, or if they didn't bother. Uh, maybe somebody here knows if somebody's on the OpenWRT. No? They didn't show up. Uh, yes, it was uh, twice, actually, but uh, then there was this DSA uh, thing. Uh, that's the next slide. <laughs> I'm coming. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I thought it was more this rejected, or lots of people was. Uh, Right. So the it was it was um, somewhat uh, tried. I oh, say, um, uh, Hauke, is it? Um, says that uh, it was tried to uh, submit uh, upstream to the mainline kernel, but it was uh, more or less refused because there was uh, the kernel was starting to get uh, something similar, and that was the DSA subsystem. The DSA subsystem uh, stands for um, distributed switch architecture, as I, as I recall. Uh, it really kind of comes from um, a feature present in uh, Marvell several switch chips, the MV88E series chips which I think were originally the uh, Intel switch chip division. I think the Martel, the Martel just brought it. Um, it, was, it was initially just for uh, the, the way the Martel chips work, but actually it was pretty generic. Uh, you could do lots of uh, other things with it. Um, uh, some uh, Broadcom and uh, some Broadcom drivers were submitted for uh, B53 series and the, BF, uh, the Starfighter 2, which I have no idea what it is, but apparently so. one of these small switch chips uh, that you found in Soho routers. Um, I see there's a Qualcomm Athros um, switch uh, supporter as well, the uh, um, 8553, I believe, the 8000 series anyway. Um, so there's, there's lots of uh, room there, but the DSA subsystem, um, and, the, and this is very, very new, it exposes all the ports that it, that it has access to, to the kernel. That means if you have um, a servo router running uh, a mainline kernel with a DSA supported switch chip in it, and it has say five Ethernet ports, that means you get ETH0, ETH1, 2, 3, 4. Right? So you get actual five ports. You can put different IP addresses on them um, and, and just use them as a router. That way you can, you can uh, bridge them together um, uh, as you like. And um, if you bridge them together, um, the magic that happens there is it offloads the actual bridging to the hardware. And that's really important, all right? Um, of course, that's what SWconfig uh, uh, also did. But this this is like it works in the kernel. Like, uh, sorry, it works in the kernel, but towards user space, exposing the ports. But it it does the actual switching if you configure it that way in hardware. 
So that's really important. Um, and the, the cool thing is, uh, the way you normally configure uh, bridging with the uh, BR control or the bridge tool or whatever, um, you just do it as usual with your interfaces as if there were NICs in your system. And um, just behind the scenes, it all, the actual switching happens in hardware. That's really important, right? Um, but the problem with the DSA is that it was intended to be MDIO only. I think that's because of the, the original Marvell thing, I don't know. Um, but it was, it was kind of limited in that way. There's lots of other ways to uh, connect uh, you know, Ethernet switches to your system. As, as many as there are buses, right? Um, and there's enough buses. So then the switch dev system came in. Um, the switch dev system uh, is a proper kernel subsystem. That means that uh, you, can, you can invoke it from any bus. For example, um, you can uh, have a switch dev driver um, that is triggered by a device being present on a PCI bus or PCI Express bus. That makes it, uh, of course, more interesting to you know, the higher end type of uh, switch chips that need the kind of bandwidth that PCI Express uh, uh, uses. Um, it, it was, it's a very generic system, right? Um, it's more generic than um, DSA. That means that DSA was essentially changed, the DSA subsystem was essentially changed in a kernel to be a switch dev driver, right? So DSA is still there. There are still DSA drivers, but DSA, the framework itself, is essentially a switch dev driver. If you want to do support, switch, switching support for um, uh, an MDIO supported um, uh, switch, an MDIO connected switch, sorry, in the kernel right now, what you would do is you'd write a DSA driver, right? Because that's kind of, it, it's kind of the MDIO part of switch dev. You might see it that way right now. It's kind of the easiest way, right? But uh, switch dev in general is um, uh, super generic. It's got standard operations to work on your FDB. So add entries, uh, age entries, set aging time, and, and various other parameters. Uh, MDB as well, support. Uh, so multicast uh, uh, caching, uh, group caching, and things like that. Um, VLANs as well, setting up VLANs. Let's switch that. Um, sorry. And the big news, and this happened last year, is that um, uh, it, was, it was a while after SwitchDev got merged um, before anything but DSA was supported. But at some point last year, Mellanox, a uh, vendor of very high-end uh, switch chips, uh, submitted drivers for their switch X2 and then their Spectrum switch chips. Uh, these are super, super high-end, right? The Spectrum uh, has a forwarding rate of 6.4 terabit per second. Um, to give you some idea, that's, that's basically, you can have a 32-port switch, uh, every port 100 gigabit, doing full duplex on every port constantly, and this thing can handle it, right? Um, right you, can, you can use a switch uh, with the Spectrum chip in it, or the Switch X2 chip in it, right now, running a mainline kernel, doing 100 gig on every port, 100 gigabit on every port. Just on a mainline kernel, standard driver, using the standard tools, IP root 2, bridge, uh, all that stuff. That's magic, right? So what Mellanox did is very much, um, it's very much uh, a pioneering thing. Uh, I think uh, pretty much everybody uh, uh, in the, in the NetDev uh, community, in the kernel, is hoping that other vendors will follow. It'd be nice if Broadcom would follow. Take a small miracle, but, you know, <laughs> it might happen. Um, in any case, there are a bunch of other vendors that are sort of on the fence about this. Uh, you might say between, somewhere in the spectrum between uh, Mellanox and Broadcom, there are a lot of other ones. Cavium uh, seems, seems kind of interesting. Um, so we'll have to see what happens. Uh, hopefully uh, some more, um, some more uh, vendors will come in and write drivers. Um, if you want to take a look at the switch dev uh, subsystem, uh, look at uh, the kernel uh, source, include net switch dev dot h. That's the entire API. It's super simple it's because it's just so generic. I encourage you to take a look at it. So that's all I got. Any questions? Yep. 6.4, so it was for uh, 
for one node, you can detail a little bit this, this number of 6.4 uh, terabytes for second. But, uh, sorry, what do you mean? 6.4, the number of itself. Yes. Which context with, uh, oh, no, that's just the total switching capacity of the spectrum chip, the Mellanox spectrum chip, the 6.4 terabit. Uh, I don't work for Mellanox or anything. I don't, I don't mean to, you know, but um, I'm just saying that's a really high-end chip. It, it, it has a total switching capacity of 6.4 terabit. Uh, I don't know, I don't know. That's just, okay, okay, that's their marketing literature. I assume it's correct. I'm naive, I don't know. So, any other questions? There's an exam after this, so if you don't have questions. Okay, thank you. I think it is low battery. Yes. Uh, no. No, it? Or maybe. It or maybe it's, it's, if it's blinking, uh, it's low battery. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's all right. Speaker? I am. Can my sense? Ray Kinsel. Sorry? Ray Kinsel. I did work on switching in the past. And uh, we were starting to do something. I worked for Intel, so we were starting to do something that looked like switched out right. for the uh, Falcon stuff. Okay, cool. Good. It got. So Ray, you're using your own laptop, right? Oh, if I can, if I'm allowed, yeah. I, I have a, I have it on um, what you call it, um, USB key. If that helps as well. No, it's it's fine. Hello. Uh, that's that's a joke. Yeah, no, this is the yoga. They will pry my ThinkPad out of my whole uh, hand. Alright, I'm gonna No, no, I looked up your, uh, your LinkedIn profile, I was talking, and uh, I saw you went to DCU, so I kind of, I kind of assumed. Uh, that was my first bad. I was in UCG before that. Oh, were you? Yeah. Okay. You know what they say about assumptions? Make an ass out of you and me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so where am I? This is nice. You see this? Yep. Laser quick box. Hardware out of, I think it's a Raspberry Pi inside. It's brilliant. I've got a little bit of cost on the load there. It's brilliant. Yeah. It's uh, not picking it up. Are you mic'd up? I know, but it's not picking up my, uh, it's not extending the display. Okay, well it worked for me. I don't know why. Very you want to do it online with the USB key. Yeah, maybe that would be better. Do you have an issue? Oh, 
I'll just put the, uh, it's okay. It's strange, isn't it? I don't know. It was a funny one. I said I exported it as PDF, so. Exported from? Uh, PowerPoint. Okay, well, why don't we PowerPoint? Okay, that'd be perfect. Do you have PowerPoint? Uh, no, I hope not. Okay, it's on the USB key. Uh, 53 meg volume. Yeah. I am again going to ask people, please, we can't have anybody in the stairwell, so if there are spare seats to, to the inside of you, please move in so that we get as many people into the room as possible. Um, if you can do that before he starts, that would be great. Could you switch there's me? one particular row. I see five seats in the middle, and there's, uh, that would be really nice if you could lock those up. And there's four in the middle here. So, excuse me. Uh, can you move that way? Thank you. Uh, 
Thank you very much. Next up, Ray Kensler presenting TLDK, a TCP IP stack on top of DPDK and user space. Can you switch me on? Can I switch you on? I hope you can. It should always be on. I don't think people can hear Hello? Hello?